I think we're good to just get started. And I don't think that was too much in the first few minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to tell you what I was thinking about the, the way we'll lay this out. We had two main choices. Um, they were really going from get started here, which is fairly comprehensive. Um, and it breaks things up in a similar way to the reference, but it's it's not always the same. And if we were to work through this as it is, then you'd see we'd end up doing a lot of things that come in the reference anyway. And we might end up um, trying to do too much or too little for each function in the get started, uh, muddy the waters a bit and not gather what we need to. So what I've decided, at least for the first um, for the first meeting, is that we're going to focus on on this thing, the reference. And inside the reference, you can see if you're familiar with, say, like how a package is built and the YAML um, that comes with package YAML. When you build your reference page, you can break things up into different sections. So the posit team or the dplyr team have broken their reference into different sections. So you can see the data frame verbs and then a subsection is rows and then columns and yeah, groups and so on. You go down and you have all, all of these here, you get to vector functions, etc. I think, or I thought that a nice gentle introduction um, would be rows because a range distinct filter don't have too many too many difficult arguments or too many novel arguments, but they do have um, some nice features that we'll see, uh, like the ellipsis and how that's used differently in a range, distinct and filter. Oh, well, the same in a range and distinct, but differently in filter. Um, I don't think today we'll get onto the slice family, and I think they probably warrant a whole, whole hour almost on them, um, or at least I haven't prepared for them. So if we do get down this far, then we could kind of freestyle it together, or we could look at a couple of the trickier parts from uh, mainly filter, I suppose. And um, yeah, does anyone, anyone, any questions or any, any doubts or thoughts or thinking that they'd want to do things differently? Because um, we did mention it was mainly going to be, I guess, Dplyr 1.1.0, but then given last week we had quite a mix of experience, I thought it was probably best to just focus on the whole, um, the whole of Dplyr's documentation. And very quickly in functions like filter, we get some some keyword or some arguments that were new in 1.1.0. So. I'm going to move over to, let, let's actually start here. But I, I've decided to do this mainly in an R markdown. So you'll see in here, I have a really kind of basic R markdown and just have headers with distinct a filter and a range. And when you guys come to present, you don't have to do it this way. Um, in the intervening period, so between now and the daylight after the daylight savings madness i'm going to make sure we've got a nice repo that everyone can just access and i did say that i would show how to make um a virtual environment with rem so i'm just gonna make a dummy one here really quickly and show you guys and you might want to do this just in case you don't want to install dplyr 1.1.0 because some of your work functions um or some of your packages require that you don't have the most up to date. So you can install packages and I've already actually got it. So you do it the normal way. And then it's really simple to start a rem um, project using our studio. You can just type rem in it and provided. Why do things go as they should? And this should 
I've just started. I'm just not in a project. Let's see. In case I've got a previous temp, which is quite likely. Um, okay, so let's run in it. And this creates a new type of project. And in this project, you can control your virtual environment, which if you don't know what a virtual environment is, or you, it sounds kind of weird, don't worry about it too much. But in, in your virtual environment in our studio, you'll have different versions of packages and provided the dependencies have been handed where well, you won't get conflicts or you'll be using the right versions of each function when you want to use various packages. But in REM or when you've initialized REM with REM in it um, and you look at your installed packages, you'll see that you've got a lot less than in a different one. So you could check is dplyr in installed.packages and it's gonna say false. But now if we install dplyr um, and you can set, um, where is it again? You can do version. There's a, there's a nice easy way to do versions. I think when you use the repo instead of like this, but say you install dplyr and then we'll check again. It's gonna take a while because dplyr is a big old package. Um, when you run that after dplyr has been installed then you'll see this time dplyr is in installed packages um and that's like a nice nice thing to know about and a nice thing to use just so that no one ends up breaking their environment but let's um let's go back to the environment that i prepared earlier which is which is this one well in this um, in this environment, when I installed uh, Deeplier, I got some some extra things that came with it when I did Markdown. So I got a bunch of packages like um, Stringer, R Markdown, etc. Um, you can test always test these things, uh, whereas I won't have I think per for example. So when we do get onto the per section. Where if we haven't already for some kind of demonst like demonstration, we'll have to reinstall um, Per in this environment. Um, but in this in this folder setup, we've got so weekly docs is what I put, and week one, the verbs for rows. And as we saw in documentation, uh, the key rows are or the key um row verbs operate and data frames arrange distinct filter and the slice family and we're going to start with what i think is kind of a nice easy one um and that one is a range and it could be quite tempting to look at a range and see what it does and think that it's operating on columns because you input a column um, or a number of columns but what a range is doing is it's rearranging the rows according to values in either the one column or more. And um, it has these nice kind of simple arguments. Um, so dot data in a range. And this is something, um, I think this was new in 1.1. I feel like this used to be data. I have to check that. But the tidyverse team or the posit team, they've been moving more towards using the dot, pre the well, the dot before the name of the argument, especially when it's something that's common like data um, or dot by, they'll use these dot prefixes to avoid con potential confusion. Probably in cases that most of us wouldn't have to worry about, but I think it's for them, it's better safe than sorry. And that's just gonna be your data frame or your tibble. And presumably if you guys are here, uh, you're, Kind of confident with the difference, but let's actually just data frame versus table. So we've got mount cars, and right now this is a data frame, and you can tell because it's printing with different features to if 
we're not going to have a tibble, I suspect. Okay, no, we do. Um, the Mount Cars, which is now telling it's a tibble, it's giving you a nice summary of the rows and the columns, and it doesn't print the whole thing. So for Mount Cars, it doesn't really matter because there aren't so many rows, but if this was a 1,000 row data frame, it you're going to get some console lag if you try to print the whole thing, and that's just going to get worse for every column that you'll find in that data frame. Um, so yeah, we our data object should be a table or a data frame, and that's one we'll see in essentially every, not every, but nearly every, well, every tidyverse data frame function, but most functions that we'll be looking at, we're going to find they operate on data frames. Um, there will, of course, be exceptions, but generally we're going to have a data pronoun. Um, then interestingly, ellipsis. So ellipsis or the triple dot is a very powerful idea in R. Um, ellipsis comes before any named arguments. So it comes after the data. I forget exactly from the style guide, but you have your data as your first argument. And then you have your ellipsis, and then you have your named arguments. And I remember looking into that a little while back, and I really just cannot remember why you do it that way. But I trust them that they know, so I just do it that way as well. Um, but ellipsis is like a very slippery character, I suppose. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on ellipsis because I think we'll as we look at how it's used in a range versus filter, we will start to learn by doing and get a better intuition about what ellipsis is. Um, but there's also dot by underscore group and the default is false. And then there's dot locale and the default is null. And if we take a look before we dive into some code about these arguments, well, ellipsis, and don't worry about data masking too much. That's something, again, we'll just gain an intuition for. Um, but it, what it tells you is where the ellipsis go. So as you get more familiar with ellipsis, you'll know that it's really important to know, well, where are these things I'm sending in going or what is, what's the intention? And very, very, helpfully, yeah, very helpfully, they tell us that it's variables or functions of variables, um, which will be sorted and if we want to sort in descending order, well, we should use desk. Um, yeah, I think I I get that ellipsis could become very confusing at the start, but it will become a lot easier to deal with. Um, so, Jack, okay. Can I interrupt? Yep. Yeah, um, yeah. Can you go a high level of what the data masking thing is? Or if you really don't want to touch it, don't touch it. But I've seen um, it once so before. Like, I mean, yeah, we could. You know, if you don't want to touch it. No, I, I don't mind touching it. Um, it kind of helps to to think in terms of how it's used. So in like a day, you get con different contexts. And in a data masking context, you're, you've got, let's say, different levels of the environment, like the global environment and the environment just of data. So in here, hmm, let me just kind of demonstrate I guess you can do lots of things when you're like creating a function uh say you've got an argument like url if you just uh you want to do something like mutate where with, this is a data masking environment um or function that uses data masking you won't be able to just do this um url equals like um url or let's say let's say this is a number just to keep it nice and easy but this is mean and this is mean you won't be able to just say mean plus one and then we call this like um non-mask you won't be able to normally just call this function and have say your df there and then if in your data frame, there's the column that you want to refer to as mean is like my underscore mean. 
you're not going to find or R is not going to find this for you. But if you do something like this, these like these braces do a lot of neat tricks for you and they kind of allow you to to operate in the environments that you want to operate in and in this case it's the data so this will overwrite that same mean column by doing something to it, adding one and um, there are other ways that you can do like data marking and stuff and then normally in our line like you could say mean sim is okay i feel like this may end up being more confusing than it's and it's not but you would then be doing something like this where you go um well, that's probably not going to work you don't want something like this and you'd start to like you can um you can operate on the right entities with like in a data masking context by using these kind of tricks. Um, that's really not a very good explanation. So that's okay. it helps. No, I mean, I mean, I definitely have used curly curly. Um, it always seems a little unclear what it's doing to me other than making things work, but it's helpful to have, have understand the various names like that, that is dealing with data masking or something. Yeah. Well, let, let's say like, look. let's yeah. say mutate mutate is a data masking function and um, you can do because it is a data masking function this takes care of it but if you wanted to like um summarize right um and let's say summarize was x equals mean of this well this doesn't work anymore because mean is not a data masking or doesn't have data masking built in so you would have to refer to something inside data or if you wanted to access your mean column and that's a column inside data well you would need to like communicate with r in, in a different way and you would need to say something like this and all that does is we turned it into we turned mean here this argument into a symbol and a symbol is a column in a data frame and what we said is this is our data frame which we're going to pass through the pipes um and yeah give me the mean store it in a new kind of variable and x is going to be the mean of the mean so this could be let's say like height is actually like going to be much easier perhaps um i will stop though in a second because this is it would very quickly go way beyond the scope of what we want to look at today and mindful of time. Um, but this one, like this will work nicely in your function because you're getting over the fact that mean is not a data masking environment by explicitly doing this stuff. Bang, bang kind of cancels a symbol and turns it into, what did it turn into? I guess kind of maybe a string. Um, but yeah, this one is a data masking environment work really nicely for you i think data masking would be something like we do a whole deep dive into the um the documentation for because i've kind of just i just use it all the time and maybe can't explain very well why i use it or how but if you don't use it sometimes it's very painful and when you do know how to use it, or when you do like get more comfortable with it you realize it's really useful um but okay let's oh so more practically though for a range right um why data masking is fun or good is that you got mount cars and you want to arrange by sill well you could do either of these you don't have to type the strings like you used to have to you can now do stuff like this and the data masking just kind of works it out for you that, oh, when you type this, you're looking for something in here. Um, and it doesn't matter if you put the string or not string. I think there was a there was a GitHub issues years back where I think Hadley had said, like, no, like just saving people typing time with these strings. It's bad, it's lazy. But it, I think it's kind of become accepted that it's more pleasant for the user to do this rather than. 
Brazil and MPG and VS and etc. Um, but okay, so by group, um, it says default equals false. So we're going to look into that and locale. Now, locale is the one thing where I thought I don't really want to touch. Um, I have it highlighted down at the bottom and it is pretty interesting like you could get some surprising results according to which locale you choose so in c um i'm going to forget which one's which i think in english it's always like a and capital a would go before b whereas in c i think it's like a lowercase a lowercase b etc followed by uppercase and there are very few circumstances where it could be um could be good to know that the reason you're getting surprising arrangements of your data is the locale that you've chosen or haven't chosen. But let's get into what um, what the function is actually doing and how its arguments are working. So when I call mount cars like this, my dot data is mount cars being piped through to the first argument of range, a range which is dot data. So if you're, you could have it like this. And then you don't ever do this. I don't think it actually works if you do, but it's basically saying ellipsis is sill. So the thing that's been that ellipsis is reading in this case is sill, and that's the it's the variable that I want to arrange by. Um, let's actually just uh, I feel like that just doesn't work. Okay, it does work. Um, so sill, I guess, would this work? Yeah, nice. Okay, so we can make it very explicit if we want to, but we didn't. We wouldn't. Uh, generally do all this stuff you just let the pipe do its thing and pass it down um, but the cool thing about ellipsis is you don't need to know in advance how many arguments are going to be passed in so it, it will give it will accept an arbitrary number of arguments which means if I want to arrange first by sill second by verse and then third by gear well I pass all three of these into the um, ellipsis and i would guess because they're unnamed arguments this is why ellipsis always comes like the arguments are always in this order because you don't want it to get confused if you later do something like that um yeah so it's this is going to give us a different output when we just do sill and um, when we then also go by this and here. So we do all of the stills first and then we have the this or verse VS and just have the zero of the verse and then all of the ones, but then we get down to the next um, grouping of sill. So we get the six and then we get the zeros of the verse again and then we get the ones inside the six and then over here in our later one gear um same thing in this case there is only and it the further you go it gets a bit not confusing but like it looks like oh well this column didn't arrange the way that i wanted it to because i got five and three and four but it did because it first gave me the fours and then the zero and there was only one zero verse so had to be a five and yeah it's arranging if in groups if you like but that's what the ellipsis is doing the ellipsis lets me lets me input an arbitrary number of arguments so if we get our documentation back well by default a range is going to do it in ascending order so we should have the lowest of sil first so all of the fours all of the sixes all of the eights and we do but if we want to do it in descending order, which me personally, I think normally you do, um, you're gonna do, you're gonna wrap each element of the ellipsis in desk. And so if you wanna arrange in descending order for sill, well, you wrap sill in desk, and then you've got eight going down six, four. And if you wanna do multiple arguments in descending order, well, you can't, as we'll see, you can't do this bottom one here. And there is a reason for that and it is documented. Um, but if you want to do all three, you have to wrap each of them and it will take care of it. And if we look back at desk, 
that desk documentation. Desk takes one argument and that argument is X. So um, desk does not take ellipsis. If you were designing a function, and I guess they don't want to do this for a reason, but you could have like my desk equals a function of dot, dot, dot. And whenever you called this function, I'd have to actually figure out how you implement the ellipsis by itself rather than just use it. So let's let's not go there. But you could have it in theory that the ellipsis that's passed to a range. Um, so the sill, the verse, or in this case, these three would be my ellipsis, although I guess they're masked. In theory, I think you could have it so that you just call it once. Um, but because desk doesn't take the ellipsis argument, it just takes X, you can only um, send in vectors. Although, so if you, as, okay, yeah. And the vector must be size 32 or one, not 96. Size 32 or one. Hmm. Perhaps you should have looked into that, um, but yeah. You could also arrange in descending order first and then ascending order, do something like this. It's kind of fine. And that's a pretty cool quirk of ellipsis, right? It's um, these guys here, these three, they are the ellipsis. They're the three things taken kind of individually here because one is in descending order and the others are not. Those are the things that are being arranged. And in a range ellipsis, um, Ellipsis represents the things that you want to arrange. Uh, I was looking, like having a little bit of fun with across and desk. Um, I just did it really quickly, and I think it's not something to go into here. But when we do get to dplyr across, which is a really, really cool function, then the person who's taking that may want to look at stuff like desk. Can you use it across to save yourself from typing desk? Imagine you had to do it, type it a hundred times, you might get quite annoyed. Um, but okay, so in the documentation of a range, it says that a range natively will ignore groups. So this, um, the tibble that it prints doesn't ignore the groups. We still see the groups exist, but, but um, this is the same thing as this, if we look at, or, yeah, this is the same thing as this, but we do have a by group argument. And if we um, select that as true, bearing in mind the default is false. So here, this is the same thing as saying oops, by group false. If we put by group equals true, well, now the grouping, is, the arrangement is different and it's doing these first. Um, we group by AM and then we go by SIL. So that's, I think that's pretty intuitive. Like it's pretty nice. I did say here, I was going to just skirt over deep by locale because personally, I didn't actually know that it existed until I looked at the documentation. Um, and I thought this was the main interesting, well, the main interesting component. So with a range kind of under the belt, like double check, but there's not, there's not too much more you could, I think, squeeze out. Oh, I did, I guess, forget to say this, which I put in the RMD, is that whether you're arranging in ascending order, in descending order, it doesn't matter. When you handle NAs, they'll all be at the bottom. And that's pretty interesting because you'd think when you're doing ascending order, if you do desk, you would just naively flip the order. Um, but you don't. You'll have your NAs at the bottom. And I think that makes sense because you would not want probably to see the NAs at the top. Um, and if you did, you could just pull and reverse the vector anyway. But okay, so the distinct function, um, it's really quite similar to arrange when you look at the documentation. So we've got dot data again, um, and we've got our ellipsis. And again, these are, the data masking context so you can input your strings or you can input the objects or you can input symbols if you want to and um, it will take care of it for you but in this case what you're doing is 
um, you're looking for the unique, essentially, um, like levels of a factor. You're looking for, say, for the sill column, if we take distinct, we're going to get all of the individual um, categories that we can. And they're just four, uh, six, four, and eight. So if I start adding arguments into the ellipsis, well, then I'm going to get going to get more things because I'm going to get all of the distinct for still and am, which is there are more combinations. And if you keep if you add something like MPG, which you remember from Mount Cars is yeah, it's like 17.8, 16.4. There are very few that are shared, uh, like 10.4. Well, we're going to get nearly the same number of rows as there are in the whole of Mount Cars. And that's what the ellipsis is doing. In this case, it's allowing us to get the distinct combinations of all. Um, but we will notice from Mount Cars to um, the distinct SIL and an MPG, well, we lose all the other columns. So up here, I've put that it has not just the ellipsis, but dot key pool with the default equals false. Or well, if you change the argument of dot key pool equals true, you get all of the columns still that you had before, but you get the individual. Um, I don't really want to call them factors, levels of the factor, because it's in this case, it's not really a factor, but you get the unique uh, values within that column or those columns that you've looked for. And it works again, it still works with the ellipsis. So here's our ellipsis and then here's dot key pool equals true and they're separate. Was this one? Okay. I have a screen in the way, so wait, wait, wait. Unexpected input still. Hmm. That's weird. So we've got AM. So AM. Can anyone, am I missing something really obvious here? Because I ran this code before. Is my pipe not right? Hmm. Okay. I'm also making a really obvious typo here. Yeah, I don't, I'd have to watch that back, but I don't see why that was, um, I don't want to know. I think the code is running on my own and maybe you have to restart your session. Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to go back, right? Um, but I mean, it's, it's why this is what I wanted to do essentially was, was this stuff. Um, and you can see now you keep all the columns and you get all the, unique values of SIL and AM or AM. Um, okay, so how does how does distinct Wait, before, interact? Sorry, before you go on, how does it choose which values of the other rows to show? Oh, it just takes the first ones. Okay. Um, so in, in, like, in row okay. order. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm not about 99% sure on that. I think it says it in the documentation and I I've always... But... I'm sure you're right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I I'll, we'll check that. I guess if we get some time, because um, I don't want to say something that's just outright false. But I'm pretty sure it's just the first value in row order. Um, or at least, if not, I've had a glaring gap in my knowledge <laughs> for quite a long time. If that makes sense. Uh, makes sense. Yeah. So let's say why are these two different. So uh, I figured just because. Um, a range, we, we were told how a range interacts with groups. I think if we have a look at how distinct does. Um, and like this output is essentially the same as this. Um, we'll see them. We, but uh, we do get a tibble um, based on the groups. So this converts our object to a tibble, the group by. And we do see that we actually have the groups present. We lose our row names because the tibble did that in the group by. Um, but the actual the values of the columns are identical. So we've got one, one, three O's and a one. So 
it's kind of like it is or it's almost like it's interacting with groups but it's just not um and that makes sense because you're getting the unique values of the column which is essentially the same as the groups um okay yeah cool um so yeah the groups are preserved i put i think for distincts are like pretty useful function um there's a lot of times that you'd want to use it to do a lot of things didn't feel like it's worth going into here because we'll do that kind of thing if slash when we get to tidy r and there might be times when you pivot longer a bunch of things and you just want to get some distinct values of some of the columns i tend to i feel like i use that a lot um but i think documentation wise it's pretty pretty straightforward and then kind of like the biggest function and in my opinion i guess the most important function we'll look at today or the one that does the most work for me personally would be deep lies filter and we probably all when we were starting out or even more embarrassingly for me when, when i wasn't starting out accidentally loaded stats which is just no point in ever doing but um started using stats filtering getting weird error messages and not not being able to figure out why um but yeah never confuse these two because they act very differently um but filters job or what a filter does is it gets rid of rows for you or it keeps rows for you you could say um and it keeps those rows wherein a condition or some conditions are met and those conditions are logical conditions um so things that evaluate to true or false and ignoring some complications say with negation um everything that evaluates to true uh, will stay and everything that will evaluate to false will stay now i would it's something i didn't think about but this is kind of like a word of caution if you are working with something it might be worth drawing up a separate data frame but if you're working with like a super simple thing let's say x equals like twitter uh, oops make it a vector so twitter and then facebook and then y is going to be there like usernames well if one is na and the other is um I don't know, yeah. if you start filtering on y not equals jack p well you just lost na as well um and you didn't really want to lose NA, probably, because you just wanted the ones that aren't Jack P. And you can imagine if that was like fruits or something like orange, apple, and lots of them, and some NAs, and there were other columns you're interested in, you wouldn't necessarily want to get rid of all the NAs. But if you leave the NAs like this, filter will get rid of everything. So we see the, the result is a table of zero like zero rows so we lost na and jack p um so it's not and and that's just the way na's nearly always evaluate to false um so even though it doesn't meet this condition it's like it is false that na equals jack p but r just says well i don't really care that it's false i'm going to get rid of your na anyway i'm going to evaluates as false to me um that is something to always be aware of but it won't unless you're working with a lot of real world data, like it's, it's unlikely to be an issue. Um, but going into deep, into the filters, exact documentation, you have uh, these arguments. So one cool thing, and I think it helps us to build the intuition of ellipsis, if it's a foreign type of concept, uh, is that ellipsis is markedly different in filter to how it was in a range and distinct. Um, Again, we have dot data, so I'm just going to ignore that for now because I think we should be used to it. That's our data frame or our table. But then we have ellipsis, and um, here it's there are key differences I've put to arrange and distinct. And the difference here is instead of it being columns that you're going to arrange by or take the unique values of, when it comes to filter, it's expressions. So, pardon me. The ellipsis allows you to feed in an arbitrary number of expressions and those expressions, as it says, should return a logical value. So 
one type of expression that will return return logical value is equivalence. Um, and if we do filter AM equals one, well, every single row that we have now in its AM column should have the value of one. Um, we could do, we can chain various things with filter because this is what ellipsis is doing for us. This is now our ellipsis. Um, we can get multiple things. Um, and we could start adding lots of them. It either needs to be this or it needs to be this. Uh, let's say RB3. Oops. And we could just keep adding them if we want to. Um, Alternatively, you can use like the and, so you can use or, or and, um, XOR. So this is inclusive or, and XOR gives you exclusive or. I doubt many people will ever want to use exclusive or. Um, if you do that's a base function in and of itself. Uh, but the key idea is that filter will respond to expressions which um, evaluate true or false. Now, if we saw in um, in filters docs, it does talk about, or it does kind of these here, shows you uh, the things that it takes in. Um, and I guess it's important to mention negation. So in this case, this says um, not give me anything that isn't the case that VS equals zero and SIL equals four. So this kind of like the same as the exclusive or, right? It's saying either VS equals zero or SIL equals four or neither of, or like not the case that they're both true. Um, I guess this one's actually more, not exactly the same, um, but you'll see what happens. In no cases should we see in here that VS equals zero and SIL equals four. So any time four will mean this is not zero. And yeah, uh, kind of like, of course it works. Um, I don't know how much, it's always hard to gauge with these kind of things in particular, um, how much experience everyone will have with the various different parts of filter. But if you go is dot na still, you're gonna lose all of them, right? Because they're all, they're all not NA. So you can use the explanation mark to reverse them and you get just your rows back. So that's the negation. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's too much more value. Um, one of the things I did want to point out is um, things that evaluate to true. Now that's, that's where it becomes basically infinite uh, in complexity and Say in Star Wars, if we take a look at the Star Wars frame, um, we've got some columns that have text. And if we want to find things, um, if we want to find rows that have certain text values within columns, if we want to keep all of the rows that have the sex, either male or female, or some other combination that has this word, well, we can use string detect and that's a function from stringer, but it just says like, is male inside the value that's inside sex? And if it is, keep it. And as male is in female, um, then the females get kept too. But you might want to say, might want to be a bit more like, precise and say, because you might end up doing stuff like this. Um, and using some regex. So if you were to use this here as like a word boundary, well, now every single one of the values in the sex is going to be male or if there happened to be something else like malevolent or that would stay, but you could wrap these things around, right? And now it's looking for a word boundary. And that means you can do, once you start combining filter with, especially in text analysis, things like string detect, um, it shows really kind of how powerful the idea that the ellipsis takes in um, expressions which are logically evaluable in. It really does, there's so many things you can do with filter that we would never ever be able to get through them. Um, but in here, 
uh, you can you can mix the type of conditions like this one is yeah okay so there's a height column which is numeric and then there's a sex column which is character and you might think because quite often you can't do things in R on different data types um especially not within columns um but filter doesn't mind it will say yeah okay i can i can check if the height is greater than a number and then i can check if um the sex equals female and this could have also been sex and female um oops sorry i didn't know stringer and you do stuff like that and uh, again you could add and any number of arbitrary conditions. Um, but now I guess we're going to get on to some what I think is like cooler stuff. Um, so before dplyr 1.0, when we wanted to do group things, we'd always use group by. Um, and I guess we'll, someone will look in a group by later on. So I don't want to dwell on that too much. But you could you could do this right you could say okay for each gender give me the rows in which the person's mass is greater than the average of that gender um and imagine if you didn't have this so we kept 14 rows um but if we didn't do this well now we only keep 10 and that's because when we don't break up for groups uh some of the gender are going to have a lower mass on average and they're not going to be above the like mixed genders mass so we lose or we filter out more rows and um, as of 1.1.0 there's and this is kind of one of the neat the neat things it's like inline grouping and this means that the grouping only applies to this one operation um and let's get the documentation back up because there's some there was uh where is it okay so it's this thing um this thing is really cool uh, and it's worth i don't think i've left enough time for us to really go into it um but it's well worth perhaps the next person i think i've put that down here a deeper dive of deep player underscore by or the slice family or whatever the person wants to um wants to look into but this this thing is pretty cool it tells like it starts explaining to you well sometimes you want to use group by and sometimes you should just want to use dot by and in those cases or it enumerates some cases for you and gives you a nice kind of intuition um but okay so inline grouping new in deep player um really cool so you cannot preserve yeah you cannot call dot by and dot preserve together um we haven't actually talked about preserve have we so whether to preserve groups or not um if we look okay i should have done this back here uh but okay in here so we call this with its default arguments and we didn't specify anything about preserve but if we put dot preserve it's false Thing. they should just disappear right the groups oh no they don't and it does say something about preserve in here doesn't it that relevant and if the grief structure is recalculated based on the data hmm. did anyone um did anyone go into this particularly thoroughly preserve so i feel like the wording is interesting right it says the grouping structure is recalculated based on the resulting data it doesn't it doesn't say exactly the grouping structure is kept or not based on this argument right i don't understand yeah that's why I'm, that's why i'm like looking at it and rereading it because i'm like well what's this actually saying the group is recalculated based on the resulting data otherwise the grouping is kept as is would it be hmm, i don't know maybe it's like 
if you try to filter in one of the groups met none of the conditions or something, it would preserve the empty group. So you'd keep three groups, say, instead of whereas preserve is false, there are only two groups present in the data after the filtering, you've got two groups. Um, or that, maybe, it only, maybe it only interacts with by really? Like if, well, if it, something about your filtering thing also has a, oh, you have by gender there, sorry, never mind. Yeah, so you can't use dot by and dot preserve in the same call. Right, right. Um, that's that's the point. Okay. Yeah. Like no matter what you do, it's just going to tell you you can't supply both. Um, preserve. What does preserve do then? I can honestly say I think I've never used preserve, and I was just glossing over it because I thought it's just going to be obvious what it does. Um, that's that's kind of a tricky one. Like to, I guess you'd have to think up some cases and test them and see how it changes the results. Um, I mean, I could look into here. So I wonder if it's got more in preserve, although this is just a copy of the same thing, right? Um, details. No, that would be a good follow-up for whoever goes next week to and all of us i guess could look into exactly what preserve is doing because personally i can't actually figure it out just from what it says i would suppose that it's more simple if i don't know if you sat with it and tried out some different things um but for now let's look at a couple of the use cases or the differences of dot by versus group by um and it's kind of important to think about when you're using the pipe to do, do a sequence of operations, if you want the grouping to persist, so you wanna do some filtering and then you wanna do another operation on groups like mutate or summarize, uh, you need to use group by because when you use dot by, it's only on the exact operation in which it's written. And you can kind of see a difference here. So in this pipe, we wanna group by gender and then we want to keep um, the rows or the actors of people who are above the average mass for their gender. Um, sounds a little bit politically incorrect, but yeah. Uh, then you create, say, a group ID and you get the people, uh, you, get diff you get like in group ID here. So let me render that just again so you get more of them. In okay, in group ID here, you get the first person um, from male, the second person male, and then the first the first female would be the group ID, and then you go back to the third male, the fourth male, the fifth male. Um, why is why is non six? Hmm, that's right, right. Doesn't seem right. Um, but okay, so you get the seventh male, and then you'd go back. So we had the first female up here, and then the second one um, is the next time a female comes along. And this is just a toy example that you'd probably never be doing something exactly like this. But if you just used um, dot by instead of group by, when you get your, when you pull the group ID, it's just, it's a count all the way up. And that's showing that it's not grouping like this one was, where we see one, two, one, three, four, five, six, seven, two. Um, which is, yeah, it's important to remember that because I think most of us are probably used to doing stuff like this, right? And then doing something like ungroup. I don't know, another mutate and blah, blah, blah. And then something else. Um, Whereas you couldn't do that same kind of stuff here because of the dot by. Um, maybe raises a question as like why you would want to use dot by. And I think it's it's just because it's it's like it's more clear or it's more direct that say if this, if there were other lines here, I don't know, there was some kind of new tape or something. Um and then some other lines in here, like arrange. I don't know. I say, but I'm going to do some renaming of stuff. And then 
um, kind of down here at filter, depending on how complex your pipe is, well, you might have completely forgot forgotten what you're grouping on or someone else coming to your code who's not so familiar with it or not so familiar with group by, they'd have to know a little bit more about R and um, pipes and various things. Whereas when you've got this nice syntax here that does it in line, well, it should be pretty clear that that dot by is in the scope of this stuff. And that's where the grouping is going to occur. And I would imagine there's some kind of like performance gains by doing it in line um but that's something to look at specifically when we get onto the 1.1.0 1 focus um but okay so i've put i picked this out as like this was interesting um shows you the supported verbs and a lot they're all kind of like heavy duty verbs stuff that we'll use a lot so when we do get onto these guys or if the person next week wants to do it there is a big deep dive to be had in here and to bring out some more examples. Um, oh yeah, okay. So you can't use group by and then later use dot by. Um, so you can't do stuff like this. And you're just going to raise an error. And uh, bearing in mind, you used to be able to do stuff like, let's go group by cell. And if we actually do an operation like, I don't know, group ID with row number. Well, we used to be able to do stuff like group by sil and am, and then go like, again, these are silly toy examples, group ID two equals row number. And that's fine because it just says like, okay, here's some grouping, now do this thing. And then when you group again, well, you just override the previous groupings and it goes, do this thing. And it's completely fine with that, but you cannot, or you are forbidden from doing this. And I think they say something like, yeah, to prevent surprising results. And that does make quite, quite a lot of sense. Um, oh, why did I include this? This was from, where was this from? Is this from, hmm. I cannot even remember why I included this. And I guess, so when you're like, it's interesting that it's dot data now. So this is like an alternative to doing the bars one, right? Um, to refer to column names. Okay, just when column names are referred to strings. Can't really think of many examples to bring that out. So oh sorry it's when you're storing these kinds of things so not the column names themselves store to strings but you're doing some of these okay yeah i mean probably a nice thing to put in um to help people out can't see myself immediately when i would need to know this or what it would stop me doing um but i'm sure there's like some stupid stuff it would stop you doing um but okay we are i guess we are over the time um and yeah is there anyone still in which i would be amazed um this is sadly just been me talking for the whole hour um if anybody wants to sign up for next week um well it's in three weeks time i'm going to formalize the github repo i'm going to put some suggestions on the sign up sheet and in the sign up sheet when you see what it is or if someone wants to do it now well you could um slice family and bye bye and i'll put that in a question mark to see if it's if it's what the person wants to do um but yeah whoever's next please sign up uh thanks for coming and hopefully next time at least when i present i'll be able to make a more interactive session okay i'm gonna i'm gonna shoot off so i think the meeting will keep going um but if not uh see you guys in a few weeks thank you see you in a few weeks